A self-portrait introduced by John Bowman. Chairman, friends, Dan Morrison and I and Johnny Costello. These recordings are fragments of autobiography, a self-portrait. Recalled on this platform tonight, close on 60 years of peace in the public service of this country. And when we saw before us the Ardish, the gargantuan Ardish that's gathered in this mansion house, we felt entitled to say to ourselves, those 50 years have not been spent in vain. James Dillon seemed destined to be a politician. As a nationalist, he spanned the two modern traditions in Irish politics, the home rulers of the Irish Parliamentary Party and the Sinn Féin generation who swept them aside, including Dillon's own father, John Dillon, in the 1918 election. Well, my political career began in the general election of 1918 when I participated in North Wexford, when I ran the campaign with... John Bulger, who's now dead, God be good to him, on behalf of Sir Thomas Esmond, who was the Irish nationalist candidate against Sinn Féin. My great-grandfather had been in the United Irishman in 1798. My grandfather had been in the Young Ireland Movement in 1848. My father had been leader of the Irish party in the House of Commons in 1898. So it wasn't very surprising that in 1918 I would have some interest in politics. Throughout his life, he rejected the simplistic but conventional view that modern Ireland had been shaped in 1916. I don't think Irish history began in 1916, though. The struggle for Irish freedom has gone on for centuries. It culminated in the treaty and the establishment of the Irish Free State with all the constitutional rights that that involved. When the inter-party government subsequently declared the Republic in 1949, that was merely another step in the evolution of what will ultimately be the independent Republic of 32 countries of Ireland. And that's the end to which every nationalist and every sensible Irishman must orient his mind and action. In another sense, Dillon had roots in the old parliamentary party. His style of oratory was a 19th century style. He was the last great exponent of it in modern Ireland. He knew how to manage a crowd. He was good with hecklers, better still, as here, in front of his own. I never give them hell. <laughs> I tell them the truth and they think it's hell. His speeches were well made. He had oratorical gifts and he knew the tricks of oratory. He had a memory well stocked with quotations appropriate for any occasion. I don't want to say that without acknowledging that the source of that observation. Ex-President Harry Truman of the United States of America. I was born at number two North Great Georgia Street and uh, lived there for the first 22 years of my life. He was the fourth son of the great Home Rule MP John Dillon. Oh, it was a very political household. And uh, it was a strange kind of life because my mother died when I was very young. She died in 1907, when I wasn't yet five years of age. And uh, we were greatly blessed in the presence of a very devoted and faithful friend who in effect, reared us all, our nurse, Mary O'Reilly, who was 65 years in our service when she died. 
and by Jenny, who assisted her, and who died in our service after spending slightly more than 60 years with us. But when we were children, my father went every Monday morning to London and didn't get back till Friday night while Parliament was sitting. So we saw very little of him. We did come back on Saturday. I always remember we used to look forward to Saturday and Sunday as the two days on which we might see him. But only too often, when we were in his company, visitors would arrive. Sometimes Mr. Birrell, sometimes members of the party, sometimes uh, callers of one kind or another. And I still remember being put out of the study with the rest of the family and hanging over the staircase to see if the visitor's hat was still upon the table in the hall. If it was, we had to stay upstairs. When it went, we went back and rejoined our father. It may cause you some surprise when I say that the name of Mr. Birrell comes to my mind. Because it's hard for people in this day and age to understand what was going on in those years of my early youth. Because once the Liberal Party had decided in 1906 under Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman that home rule was a fundamental part of the policy of the Liberal Party in Great Britain. My father and John Redmond and P.P. O'Connor and the leaders of the nationalist movement foresaw the final triumph of all the long struggles that had gone on for self-government in Ireland and realized that the Home Rule Bill was going to pass and that we were going to have a government for the 32 counties of Ireland. Another occasional caller to the house was a poet and school teacher, Podrick Pierce. I didn't remember him very well, but he used yes. to come to our house regularly. He was a great friend of my mother's, and he was also uh, a friend of my father's. Uh, and uh, my mother, I remember, corresponded with him a good deal about the founding of St. Enders. And we very nearly all went to St. Enders because Shortly after my mother died, my father actually went out to St. Enders to enroll us there. But when he saw all the boys playing football in front of the house in kilts, he thought that was going a bit far and turned round and sent us all to Mount St. Benedict. Years later, James Dillon recalled his school days with the Benedictines at St. Benedict's in Gorey. Oh, well, Father Sweetman, who was the headmaster, was a genius. But he had all the characteristics of genius. I think it was a wonderful school. It was a very small school. There were only about six of us there. But um, it had character and distinction. And uh, it, had, it hadn't a great many of the luxuries that young people are accustomed to now. But it, uh, if you survived Mount St. Benedict, uh, you showed marked qualities for survival. Uh, perhaps the rigours of life there prepared me for rigours of political life thereafter. He was home from school during the Easter holidays in 1916 in his house at North Great Georgia Street, almost overlooking the city centre, when the Easter Rising broke out. I was in North Great Georgia Street while it was going on. Uh, and uh, I remember my father trying to contact uh, John Lemon, who was in London. And I remember after the Rising was over, uh, my father's desperate effort to prevent the execution. I remember he's going up to see old Lord Wimborne. And Wimborne explaining to him, Wimborne was the Viceroy. That civil government had been suspended and Sir John Maxwell, the Commander-in-Chief, was now the head of the military government. And my father and Wimborne went to see Sir John Maxwell to remonstrate with him and point out that 
any executions would be a catastrophe. And uh, old John Maxwell, in his own way, was a decent old creature. He'd been an old army general in Egypt for years. I doubt if he'd ever been in Ireland before in his life. And he saw himself as administering a colony, as he would have administered the Sudan. And he was most sympathetic, and said that he had the greatest sympathy with my father's view, and that whereas he had planned to execute 500, he'd reduce it to 50. And it was at that stage that my father despaired of achieving anything here, and left for London, and protested in the House of Commons, and got a debate in which he spoke, passionately denouncing the executions here, and when he'd finished speaking, Asquith, who was Prime Minister, rose from his place and crossed over to the floor and leant down and said, I'm going to Dublin now, Mr. Little, by special trade and destroyer, because that's the only way I can stop the executions. And Asquith left the house and uh, went to Dublin. And when he landed at Kingstown, as it was then called, he assumed the office of Chief Secretary, re-established civil rule, and put an end to martial law, and stopped the executions. But in the course of the previous night, the military authorities had been tipped off by a Tory who shall remain nameless, that the debate was finished in the House of Commons. The British government had given an undertaking there'd be no further executions until the debate in the House of Commons had taken place. And so, the moment they got notice the debate was finished, and that Asquith was on his way to Dublin, they took out Tron McDermott and Connolly and shot them. But they were the last two people executed. James Dillon's ambition as a boy was to study medicine, but others had other expectations. Oh, I would have wished to be a doctor. I never had any doubt about it circumstances didn't make that possible because somebody had to take over the uh, business and my eldest brother became a priest, my second brother became a doctor, my next brother became a professor of Celtic study and uh, I was the one who had to take over the business and my youngest brother became a priest. He's a monk of Glenstall Abbey. James was to be in charge of the family business. He studied commerce at UCD. But I never took my degree. I got tired of it. I didn't think it was very practical. Uh, and I was, I have a somewhat pragmatic mind. And lectures on uh, political economy seemed to me damn dull. <laughs> so I went to Selfridge's first in London. And then with letters of introduction from Mr. Selfridge, I went first to the fair and then to Marshall Fields in Chicago. He stayed 18 months. Oh, I loved America. I love the American people, and I was very happy in America. But my uncle, William, who was my father's eldest brother, was a practicing attorney in Chicago, and his sons were practicing as attorneys in Chicago too. So I had family connections there. The young James Dillon's Chicago in the 1920s was a very different place, a more genteel place than the legendary Chicago of Al Capone. Oh, strange enough, I was there all the time. Al Capone was in the full flower of his activity. But he was operating in a part of the city called Cicero, which would be like Ballyboch in yeah. Dublin. And you could live in Rathmines or Rathgar and not know what was going on in Ballyboch. Yeah. But of course, Chicago was a much bigger city. But the slaughter and mayhem that went on in Cicero uh, nobody heard of it in Rogers Park or, or Lakeshore Drive or The Loop, beyond what they read in the newspapers. Later he could remember the American Midwest as a frontier society. I saw, 40 years ago, the frontier. I lived in Colorado uh, with an aunt who had been stolen by the Indians when she was a small child. Uh, and she often told me stories of the, her experiences then and her friendship, the friendship of our father, Mr. Ratcliffe, who was the first settler in Douglas County, well, in that valley in Douglas County in Colorado. And she often told me how 
when the uh, Sioux Indians, I forget if they were Sioux or Arapahoes, I think they were Sioux, used to be on the warpath. The local Sioux chieftain would call on Mr. Atlas and ask him to persuade his wife not to sit between the lamp and the window because his young braves on the warpath couldn't resist such a target. And therefore he'd ask Mr. Ratliff to get Mrs. Ratliff to set the lamp between her and the window for the next three or four days until the fighting was over. But it was, it was the frontier still when I was there and we rode horses and rounded up cattle on horses. I'm told it's all done now in jeeps and helicopters. But in those days who rode? Dylan returned to Ireland. W.T. Cosgrave's Common a Gale was still in the ascendant. The young Dylan became interested in politics. I first went to help late Dan McMenamin, who was the, the Common a Gale candidate. No, he was an independent uh, nationalist candidate in Derrigal. And there were a great many of old nationalists still living in Derrigal. Many of them people who had never voted since 1918, had never taken any part in Sinn Féin, in either of its sections. And uh, in the general election of 1932, I myself stood as an independent in Donegal and was elected at the head of the nationalist poll and remained a member for Donegal for five years and then the election of 1933 came along and Mr. Cosgrave who was leader of the uh, oh well uh, it's a long story because after I became uh, independent member of uh, the Gaul Mr. Frank McDermott initiated a farmers and ratepayers organization and then he asked me to join it and we agreed to launch a new organization, which we would call the National Center Party. And I fought my second election in Donegal in 1933 as a member of the National Center Party. Next came the brief Blue Shirts era. In his last public speech in 1983, James Dillon defended the Blue Shirts of half a century before. And I want to recall with pride that in my first years in the Fine Gael Party, we fought a desperate battle for the preservation of free speech in this country. And let it never be forgotten that we could not have won that battle but for the blue shirts who helped us to win it. Blue shirt development was necessary to defend the right of free speech. When Fiona Foyle were first elected government of this country, they were quite determined to eliminate all constitutional opposition. And it was extremely difficult to address a public meeting at all. I remember the first time I saw the blue shirts was in McCroom, and I was a member of the National Centre Party. And when I started to address the meeting, the Fiona Foyle mob tried to howl me down. And I remember one of the fellows in blue shirts appearing and saying, we don't agree with you, Mr. Dillon, but we think you have a right to speak. Give us five minutes and we'll see you get that right. So I said, all right. And he turned on the mob, scattered them, and returned and said, now, Mr. Dillon, say what you have to say. And I proceeded to address our meeting. But for the intervention of the blue shirts on that occasion, the fear of foil mob would have successfully prevented me from addressing that meeting. And I had many similar experiences in the subsequent two or three years. Last November, in the Doyle. Then came de Valera's I economic war with Britain. That it was our intention to give a substantial permanent reduction in the annuities which the farmers were paying. I knew we were going critics. to unite the Irish people and bring together the people who were marching together in the past, but I didn't think we'd reunite them so quickly as to get Mr. Cosgrave at last to see that the Irish tenant farmer couldn't afford to pay 
these annuities and send them over to England so easily as, as he was in the past. Then there came the economic war and the vital need to provide our people with some alternative to the Vienna Foreign Government in order that we could put an end to the economic war, which was an act of uh, utter insanity on the part of de Valera uh, at that time. And so we formed the uh, Filigale, which was an amalgamation of Common Gale, the Blue Shirt, and the National Centre Party. The outbreak of the Second World War brought a change in Dillon's politics and in his career. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Your government decided its policy early last spring and announced its decision to you and to the world. We resolved that the aim of our policy would be to keep our people out of the war. Anglophile and distinctly pro-American, James Dillon, he once said, I, I wouldn't with the, have the slightest hesitation in saying that America is my spiritual home. So distinctly pro-American, James Dillon was sceptical about Irish neutrality. When invited onto the All-Party National Defence Conference, he appealed to over Radio Warren for volunteers for the Defence Forces. Unlike other speakers, he did not take the view that danger was imminent from all sides. Personally, I have no doubt of the source from which this threat of invasion comes. And I don't believe that any reasonable citizen of this state has much doubt about it either. All other politicians, whether pragmatically or in principle, were solidly pro-neutral, an attitude reinforced by the anti-Irish propaganda then pervasive in Britain. Error, remaining inflexibly neutral, reaffirms that British men of war shall not use Irish bases in the Battle of the Atlantic. The strategic importance of Ireland is obvious. It stands on the direct lifeline between the states and Great Britain. Enemy attackers from Norwegian and French bases converge on an area west of Ireland. To meet them, we have to operate from comparatively remote harbours, well to the east of the French ports which now shelter German bombers and submarines. This British newsreel was entitled, Ireland, the Plain Issue. Here, Captain Bernard Ackworth, the famous writer on naval strategy. The Irish ports would greatly assist the working of the vital convoy system and thus increase its efficiency and reduce still further the sinking of merchant ships. In case of need, they would be harbours of refuge. But airfields near these ports would, to a much greater extent, increase the Atlantic area over which our aircraft could operate effectively. Then came the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 and President Roosevelt's response. No matter how long it may take us, to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. America's entry into the war reinforced James Dillon in his belief that Ireland should not stand aside. There was grave danger that Hitler might have won the war. And he very nearly did. And uh, if he could have succeeded in cutting off the United States of America from Great Britain, we would have all become satellites of the Nazi Empire. And as I would prefer to be dead than to be living under either Hitler or Stalin. Uh, I pointed out that we, once America entered the war, we ought to give America facilities to prevent the Germans from cutting the sea link between the United States and Great Britain. Advocating this policy cost him the deputy leadership of his party. But the parting with Fine Gael, when it came, was by mutual agreement, as Liam Cosgrave remembers. He was convinced that uh, what he said was, in his view, the right attitude. Others of us disagreed with him because we felt that once the state had decided to be neutral, as it was public policy, well, that policy should be adhered to. But uh, 
Uh, James Dillon was always fearless in expressing his views. And that was an amicable parting, was it, between himself and Fine Gael in 1942? Oh, very amicable. Uh, I, I haven't a correspondence in front of me now, but it was quite amicable. And Dillon always retained great affection and respect for W.T. Cosgrave. I'd sum him up in my memory by saying that he was, in fact, as nearly perfect a Christian gentleman as I have ever known. And I don't think anything I could add to that would tell you more explicitly what my recollection of William T. Cosgrave is today. Although a TD from his first successful election in 1932 until he retired from Parliament in 1969, James Dillon spent only six years as a government minister in the 1948 to 51 and again the 54 to 57 coalition governments with John A. Costello as Taoiseach. And all six years were spent as Minister for Agriculture. I never wanted any other ministry or I never wanted any other job because I wanted the opportunity of completing the work my father had begun. He had persuaded the people to keep a firm grip on their holdings. I wanted to make those holdings worth keeping a firm grip on. No skilled plowman who can manage a pair of horses will prove unequal to the task of plowing with a tractor. His skill can only be brought to bear on one acre per day with horses, whereas with a tractor, he can deal with three acres in the same time. If you ask me what part of the work as Minister for Agriculture I look back upon with greatest satisfaction, I have no hesitation in saying the uh, agricultural provisions of the 1948 trade agreement, the land project, the line scheme, the institution of the Agricultural Institute. These were the high water marks. There was only one thing I failed to do, that I wanted to do, and that was permanently to establish the parish plan. I had got it started pretty over a pretty wide area, but my successor, Mr. Smith, proceeded to dismantle it. They are now trying to revive it and call it the pilot areas, 20 years too late. At this moment, there is concluding in the six northeastern counties of our country, a fraudulent general election designed to demonstrate to the world that the land in which St. Patrick lies buried is not in Ireland. James Dillon was also engaged no in the anti-partition campaign, this speech to a farmer's dinner in Drogheda in 1949 that in hoping for the end of partition, we are hoping for their return home. And we must prepare our minds and strengthen our resolution. When that time comes, and it may come sooner than many of us think, that we shall make good our word, that when they come home, they will be made welcome in their own home, and that they are right to think and act according to their conscience, will be as sacred to us as is the right of the most extreme nationalist he was a, a most uh, compelling speaker who had, as you know, a wonderful flow of language, uh, a great knowledge of uh, Irish history, indeed of European and world history, and was very well informed on uh, any topic on which he spoke. Liam Cosgrave, who succeeded James Dillon as leader of Fine Gael, can remember Dillon as a public orator over a period of 50 years. He first heard him as a small boy when he attended political meetings with his father, W.T. Cosgrave. Well, uh, of course, I think you have to project yourself slightly back. Uh, these instruments we're talking into now are relatively new, and uh, they're still newer as far as public meetings are concerned. Uh, 30 or 40 years ago, you only had them at the big meetings. 
you very often hadn't an amplifier and if you had it very often broke down so you had to learn to speak to the edge of the crowd or as far as you could get your voice to carry James Dillon had a very powerful voice and used it to great effect I am a very good parliamentarian I became so from the experience of discussing public affairs with my father, who was a great parliamentarian, from my reading and from my own experience. And primarily because I have a great reverence for Parliament as the citadel of individual liberty, your freedom and mine. Now I want to tell you something. This is on my behalf a valedictory address. If the Lord spares me till next September, I'll be 75. Major speech to a Fine Gael Ordesh in 1977. And I think when you reach that age, it's time to stop talking at public meetings. <laughs> but because I see so many old friends in this audience. But what's much more alarming, because I see so many boys and girls who are only fit, not fit to be my sons, but to be my grandchildren. I think the time has come to say a very special word to them. And it's to them I address myself now. You will, when you are going about your work, in politics, someday or another, when you come in tired from licking envelopes or knocking knockers looking for votes, say, what kind of a fool am I to be in politics? I want you all to be able to answer that question to your own individual satisfaction. To ask yourself then, what is politics? You've often heard the phrase that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And when you're licking the envelopes, and when you're knocking on the doors, and when you're holding branch meetings to which nobody turns up on time, <laughs> remember, remember that you are paying you're keeping your vigil for freedom. Now, most of you young people have been born in freedom. And the terrible danger is that you would forget what a precious thing it is. I wasn't. I was born before this state was founded. And I know what it means to live without an Irish government to govern. And that brings me to a word I want to say to you before I conclude by quoting Edmund Burke. I remember when I was young, I had a great number of friends amongst the Royal Irish Constabulary and the Dublin Metropolitan Police. And one of the strange things about those times were when these fellows would come in to have a cup of tea in the kitchen or to pay you a visit, they were neighbours' children. But when they put their cap on or their helmet in the city of Dublin, you always got a kind of a jerk when you saw the heart surmounted by the crown. From 1959 to 1965, James Dillon was leader of Fine Gael. In 1969, when he retired from the Dáil, Michael Littleton questioned him about his career. Was he disappointed at never being Taoiseach? I hope that was the question you were politely in, in, uh, making to me. And the answer is no. And uh, it was interesting to me at a meeting at the Law Students Debating Society in the King's Inns to hear Mr. Lamas say that he detested the job of being Taoiseach, that he never wanted to be Taoiseach, that he wanted to be Minister of Agriculture, and that's where all his interests lay. I entirely sympathise with that view. Mr. Lamas seemed to me to be more interested in commerce. 
Did, you, I, did I not say the Department of Industry and Commerce? That's where these entire interests lay. I entirely sympathize that view. I would have detested the job of being Taoiseach. Uh, uh, and indeed, I wouldn't have wished to occupy any ministry other than the Department of Agriculture. What, what would hold you back from wanting to, what many politicians would regard as being the ultimate post? Because the job of Taoiseach is in fact very much the job of a schoolmaster. If he's a good Taoiseach, he delegates to his ministers the duties of their several ministries and leaves the operation of those ministries to them. His principal job is to take or to preside over the taking of the broad decisions of policy and then to invigilate the activity of his, of his ministers to see that they do their jobs. I much preferred doing of the job rather than making me neighbor do it. In a sense, it's a matter of, I suppose, personal taste as to what kind of work you want to do most yourself. I suppose it is. And I suppose that there are many men who haven't got that deep interest in one particular branch of government activity that I undoubtedly had in regard to the Department of Agriculture. You were Minister for Agriculture, of course, in a coalition government. How do you think that government worked, as an exercise in politics, I mean, and uh, what future do you think there may be for such coalitions or different coalitions in the future? I think the two inter-party governments we had, or coalition, whichever you prefer to call them, were probably the two best governments we had since the state was founded and had the immense value of giving the Labour Party an opportunity of participating in government, which I think was an immense, a very desirable thing. Why? Because by the very nature of our political setup, the prospect of the Labour Party ever getting a clear majority is remote, and therefore the only prospect of their having a voice in government and a share of the responsibility of government comes through coalition. You don't agree, then, that uh, there will come, as, come a division in Irish politics to the right and to the left, overriding the present Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Labour divisions? I often wonder when young men like yourself ask me about the right and the left, do you know what you're talking about? What is the right and the left? I see a distinction between tyranny and liberty. I think... Hitler and Stalin were both on the right, same side. Whether you call that right or left doesn't differ to me. We are on the side of freedom. They are on the side of tyranny. And that's the real cleavage in the world today. I was talking about a division such as exists in Britain between conservatives and labor. There are a good many people beginning to wonder who's furthest to what you call the right in England at the present time. I am a radical liberal, and I would regard myself, in your sense of the term, of being somewhat to the left of either of the existing British parties. Do you think then that there will be a future for coalition or inter-party governments based on the present three parties in the decades to come? Inevitably. I think that is the necessary consequence of proportional representation, and the Irish people have made it perfectly clear by referendum that they want proportional representation and the consequential existence of inter-party governments in the future. In spite of the fact that Labour have taken a, a position against coalition, Labour, all parties, take positions. But you know the world doesn't stand still. And unless parties are about to die, they don't stand still either. Tempera mutantur et nos mutamor in illis. Times change and we change with them. James Dillon, on the day he retired from the Dáil in 1969, Dillon remained a much sought-after platform speaker. He was, if anything, a more skilled orator as he got older. Whenever he appeared on a platform at a Fine Gael or Desh, it was difficult for the delegates not to ask for a speech, and when sensed on his part, he didn't need much persuasion. 
Difficult also for him not to upstage the current front bench who were sharing that platform. Invariably, as here in the closing of his valedictory address in 1977, he addressed himself to the young. And now, I want to conclude the last speech I'll ever make before the Finnegan Ardesh. Yes, I'll be here in spirit. Don't worry about that so long as the Lord leaves me. And if you... I'll get to heaven with the help of God. And even when I'm there, I'll be here in spirit too. But I want to read to you three things that Edmund Burke said in the course of his career. And the youngest boy or girl here should commit them to memory if they want to serve this country to the best of their ability. First, he said this, falsehood has a perennial spring. This means that you must be prepared to cut falsehood down year in, year out, as the farmer cuts the weeds, which unlike crops can grow and flourish no matter how often they are cut down and burned. And secondly, he said, and this you all ought to remember, old and young, All that is necessary for evil to prevail is that good men should do nothing. And your presence here testifies to the fact that we have in this country an immense reservoir of people resolved that they'll not do nothing. And your presence here is a notice to evil that it will never prevail in this country for the want of action by good men. He was clearly enjoying himself. He was aware of his ability as a speaker, of his popularity, and aware of his impact. He also said this, and all of you should remember, when bad men combine, good men and women must associate. Else they will fall one by one, a nun pitied sacrifice in a contemptible struggle. Now, if you'd remember those things, you'd be working as hard for Finnegan for your old men and women as you started to work as young boys. Oratory is a strange word. I was recently asked a similar question, and I pointed out that it's the real test of successful parliamentary speaking for a parliamentarian is, can he hear the silence? Ordinarily, when you address any assembly, there's a constant murmur and rustle going on while you're speaking. But on rare occasions, you can hear the silence. And the moment you hear the silence, you know that you have caught the absolute attention and sympathy of your audience. And that's the high watermark of parliamentary performance. And I want to conclude with another of Edmund Burke's quotations. And it's specially addressed to the media for whom the Taoiseach had certain sibylline words to say. <laughs> And mind you, it's from the media I borrowed that expression. <laughs> and I would say to the media and to our own members, for God knows nobody ever led Finnegan that doesn't know who our harshest critics are, the members of the Finnegan party, <laughs> up and down the country. And I want to say to them and to our friends in the media, with Edmund Burke, applaud us when we run. Console us when we fall. Cheer us when we recover. But let us pass on. For God's sake, let's pass on. <laughs> Thank you.
That program, James Dillon, A Self-Portrait, was presented and produced by John Bowman.